there's emerging research, although it's in rodent models, but still very fascinating, that this particular compound could be really, really good when it comes down to lowering blood sugar, but more importantly, managing insulin resistance at a much higher level than just controlling how much glucose is soaked up and yada yada. What I mean by that is like, we're starting to understand like top down what's working and what's not working in the world of insulin resistance. If you look at simple things like, uh, let's just say apple cider vinegar or even just um, berberine and things like that, we're working on a, what is called a GLUT4 level. Okay, we're looking just basically helping glucose get into the cell. Although long-term that can have a positive benefit because it's lowering the glucose and allowing it to get into the, the, you know, the effective cell, we need to look at like protecting from these bigger systemic issues. And that's where this rodent model research is really fascinating. What's funny is this particular compound is investigated predominantly as a performance enhancing compound. In fact, I took it for years when my training intensity was higher to help me recover. So we're gonna dive into this, but full disclaimer, like when you look at this earlier research, you have to be okay with looking at rodent model stuff. The human data is just lacking, but we're getting there. The human data is there on the performance side. It's just very embryonic on the glucose side. Let's dive in. I also put a link down below for 30% off your entire first grocery order with Thrive Market. Cool news, I created a nut butter, a dessert nut butter with them. I have one that's macadamia nut butter. I have one that's cinnamon Brazil nut butter. Okay, and then I have one that is also chocolate hazelnut, a lot like Nutella, except they're all sweetened with allulose, so they're super low carb, and you still get the polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated fats, especially in the macadamia nut one, but it also just helps us out, right? I created this product, spent two years formulating it with Thrive, so if you give it a shot, I'd really appreciate it. So you try that link down below, you'll save 30% off your whole grocery order, not to mention they have things like cottage cheese and vegetables, it's a full grocery store now legitimately, even fresh, and it's shipped to your doorstep in a day or two. So that link down below, 30% off, plus a free $60 gift. The compound that I'm talking about is one that our mitochondria produces naturally, but it only produces enough for itself. So the mitochondria produces this compound, but it doesn't produce enough for our entire body. And it's a very protective compound, which is again, why this is researched so heavily in the sports performance world. Because when we increase our intensity, we have an increase in inflammation. And we don't produce enough of this compound to reduce the inflammation that comes from sort of artificial intense work. But if we artificially can add more via supplementation, we can counteract that. Like I noticed my recovery was intense. But let's look at the hyperglycemia research. So this particular study was published in the journal Acta Pharmacologica. And the compound I'm talking about today is called alpha lipoic acid. Now I'll give you exactly how much you should consider taking and also some dosing strategies as we get a little bit further in this video. Let me just relay this study to you. What's interesting about this study is it's mice, but they put mice on a high fat diet. Did you know that a high fat diet can actually induce metabolic damage? And I'm not saying that as like a total shill and a weirdo. I'm saying that because it's truth. Just like a high sugar diet can induce metabolic damage, a high fat diet, especially in tandem with carbohydrates, can trigger metabolic damage too. So what they did is they induced metabolic damage. They induced insulin resistance and hyperglycemia by giving mice a very high fat diet. But they gave them a high fat diet with alpha lipoic acid at a certain milligram per kilogram dose, or they put them on a high fat diet with the vetted pharmaceutical metformin. This is what's wild. The alpha lipoic acid group actually performed just as well, if not better, than the metformin group. The alpha lipoic acid reduced the hyperglycemia and it reduced insulin resistance instances. How is this potentially happening? Well, we have some mechanisms. Let's dive a little deeper. First, they noticed that glucose production decreased. So perhaps gluconeogenesis went down. Basically, they were producing less glucose in the sake, well, we don't need to produce and have glucose go sky high if we're not using it. So it kind of helped the body find this homeostasis. But more importantly, it increased the expression of things that were associated with like uh, glycogen synthase, which takes glucose out of the bloodstream and stores it in our muscle. We want that. Like, wouldn't it be great to be able to have like a piece of cake and have that go into the muscle versus like stay in the bloodstream circulating, inhibiting lipolysis and causing other issues? 
Like, I mean, that's what a healthy functioning metabolic human would do. It would store it where it needs to store it and not just have it go sky high in the bloodstream. Now, what's interesting about this and why it's being researched so much is it doesn't seem to be doing it by just increasing GLUT4 translocation and sucking glucose into the cell. It actually is triggering things from the top down. That's why it was investigated in a protective sense. So they didn't just give mice a bunch of sugar and then give them alpha lipoic acid and see if it would slow down the sugar absorption. They were like, no, what happens if we actually instill legit metabolic issues? And it seems to counter that. So it seems to have an impact, probably via reducing inflammation. So we know inflammation and insulin resistance go hand in hand. We know that high fat diets and bad diets go hand in hand with this, also go hand in hand with inflammation. So perhaps we're working at a truly genetic level. We're also inhibiting the action of nuclear factor cap B, which is a transcription factor that travels to the nucleus of a cell to trigger inflammation to sort of begin. There is some very fascinating stuff here. Now, what's a safe dosing strategy for you? Now, in this particular case, they were looking at, um, you know, like, I think it was in the ballpark of like one to four milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, and that's a fairly safe place to be, but I think that's relatively low. So in a prophylactic kind of way, at a low dose, uh, that would only equate to probably like, what, 300 to 400 to maybe 500 milligrams for most people. Whereas like the minimum effective dose in an exercise setting seems to be 600 and the effective dose seems to be closer to 1200 and you look at the more intense literature. But if this is something you're taking daily sort of as a potential like way to combat this, I think sitting in the 300 to 600 milligram ballpark is good. You wanna make sure you take it on an empty stomach. Do not take it with food. The bioavailability orally is already only about 30%. So take it fasted as much as possible or two hours after eating, but you're gonna get the best effect if you're totally fasted. You might feel a little bit of burning. It sometimes tends to like make you almost feel like you've got these like burning type burps. That's a pretty common feeling and your urine is gonna smell like asparagus. So a couple of things to be aware of. Now you could also cycle your dosing, but reality is this is something that's produced naturally by the body, something we find in red meat and broccoli in smaller amounts. You're just taking a concentrated amount of something that we know has some solid evidence behind it. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. And remember, I'm not a doctor, I'm some dude on the internet. So forget everything I just said. I'll see you tomorrow.